Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. You turn out the lights. You slip beneath your cozy covers, eager to drift into a new dream. All seems well from beneath the sheets until something strange begins to happen. A curious vibration begins at the back of your head, pulling you out of your body. You sink beneath the bed to find a disturbing face grinning from the darkness. Some thing you didn't know was there. From light-beaming astral worms to camp counselor pyrokinesis, we explore the reality hidden just beyond the veil. So dim the lights and stoke the campfire as we present to you, curious listener, strange but true tales of the inexplicable and the unknown. Synchronicity, Sasquatch, Homunculus, Alien Races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury! In. Close your door! What's the uh, Inner Earth Disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Felt, Magicians are Demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. Summonings, Morality, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Why to care? Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Welcome to Belief Hole. I am Chris. Oh. I'm Jeremy. Oh. And I'm John. Fatality. We are back. Season four, episode one. Season four. <laughs> Good to be back. And we've got an awesome episode, a strange listener stories episode. I'm so excited for this one. An incredible collection of bizarre and unexplained stories. We've got astral worms. We've got devils and dumb waiters, Ooh. sinister grinners. Forbidden technology in automobiles or something related to that. Tantalizing. Yes. And that's just to name a few. It might be our best yet. We've had some pretty great ones. It's going to be hard to top. I know. But I'm looking forward to the challenge. We are going to be up to it. Yes. And our listeners with their awesome stories are definitely up to it. Yeah, you guys outdid yourselves. Thank you for these submissions. Yeah, thank you for sharing your personal real encounters. Yeah. And anyone new that's listening out there, don't be afraid to share your experiences with us. We had some people send in some really interesting stuff recently that we just did on our private live stream. And anyone that has any video evidence or photographs or anything like that that are unique and spooky or whatever, send them in. Yeah, go to beliefhole.com and click on the listener stories button. Share your paranormal stories. And if you're interested in seeing that special creepy shadow person video we got from Sheila, which was awesome, we did a whole bit on it in our members only live stream. So if you're interested and you're not a member yet, just go to beliefhole.com and click on the uh, become a member button, the big red button that floats there waiting for you to click. Access granted. Because it's interesting. Yeah. There's something there. I mean, it's, yeah. it is a humanoid. It's a humanoid. It's weird. It's yeah. definitely, out of all the footage you see in, you know, all these different channels, I thought it was pretty compelling. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously physical there. It's not a mist. It's not CG. It's, it's three in the morning and it's a childlike height. Yeah. This thing is around three foot tall. We did a, like a little scaling analysis of it. It's about three foot tall comes out. She said when she was there, obviously she could see it better because the video is from like a cell phone. So it's not as clear as at when night. she saw it at night. But she said it pointed at her and you can kind of see that, that it seems like it's looking at her. And it comes from nowhere. Yeah, it's very strange. That's what I think is fascinating. Yeah, it's hard to tell because of the, obviously because of the resolution, but it, you can tell that it is a small humanoid entity, all black and it's just creepy as yeah. all So either out. Sheila is a liar and she set, set it up <laughs> or there's something very strange yeah. there. And I trust Sheila. It yeah. sounds like she has plenty of stuff going on in her life when it comes right, to the exactly. paranormal. That's the thing. There's a whole backstory. Exactly. There's corroborative context to the story yeah. that includes her illness that she's been experiencing, which may or may not be connected to that. But also before this happened, two months before, she started seeing these robed, cloaked entities. She called them dark figures, shadow people. She even snapped a photo of this shadowy mist that when we zoomed in, definitely looked humanoid-ish on top of the roof yeah. above her. So she's been, she tries to capture it. She said in a hundred pictures, she might get one with right. something in it. So it's not easy to do, but I think she captured some of the best footage of if that's what this is, it's by far 
some of the best food. Yeah, I've there's ever seen. there's definitely an ecosystem of things out there around us that are unseen that we can't see. The longer we do this, the more I believe that. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to deny. And we're going to take a peek into this unknown, unseen world a little bit today with some of these stories, because like every time we do a Strange Listener Stories episode, we tend to have these patterns. And one of the patterns that we have today are astral entities, shadow people, things of the unknown, the unseen. Yes. And some very bizarre ones. Yeah. And the astral one in particular that will be coming up in the second half of this episode, it's astral, but it's not. That's what I think is so fascinating about this. I mean, it may not be astral. This is one kind of potential explanation for this thing, but it's something that our witness, our listener may have experienced something passing through the astral to the physical or saw into the astral momentarily. It's just a really bizarre story. So stick around for that, guys. We got glowing uh, astral worms and... All kinds of stuff. Out of body adventures. Let's get into it. I'm excited for this. What's our first story, Chris? All right, I thought I'd start with a a unique tale. This is something we have not covered yet on the show at all, really. We've talked, obviously, about mind over matter stuff. We've talked about morphic fields, which for those of you who don't know, is the ability to perceive an invisible connection with other living things around you. But we are going to be diving into Sonia's story. And I call it pyrokinetics at camp. Oh, so pyrokinesis. Indeed. Fascinating. I was an aide at Camp Chenyachkuk on Lake George, New York, in the 1980s when I had this experience. It was after our campers had gone to sleep and we were able to roam around the camp together. I was with a small group walking around the woods after midnight. And as a teen, you get to talking about mystical things. I was relaying a story or two my high school professor had told me about a friend who was able to heal a burn he had witnessed by meditation, and we got to talking about shamanism, making things disappear and such. We all got pretty excited about the topic, and as I was exclaiming back of how cool it would be to make a group of trees disappear, I had picked up a twig and said, or set fire to a stick. At that very moment, we all witnessed a spark from the twig in my fingers as I quickly, in shock, dropped it from my hand. Everyone was silent, and then I remembered everyone leaving in shock. Only one person from the group talked to me after that, and years later reminded me to never forget that it really happened. I know at this point in my life, I was very psychic about things. I was having almost daily OBEs, and felt that energy like adrenaline very often. I later in my 20s took a medical qigong, It is fascinating what we experience as teens or at other times in our lives that others have a way of totally dismissing. I will try to reach that friend from camp. It has been 16 years or so since we have been in touch, but maybe he remembers more from that night. Sonia. Isn't that strange? Yeah. So just by mentioning catching the stick on fire and it ignites in her hand. Yeah. You wonder like what could have created that in that moment. I do think that there is, I mean, from a lot of the stuff that I've seen, there is a bioelectric energy yeah. that people have, whatever you want to call it, chi or whatever. I do think that that is, it just, from stuff I've seen, I think you might be mentioning something here Yeah, that's pretty compelling. Yeah, and I think, you know, John and I had the experience recently with the help of Megan. This reminds mm-hmm. me of that in a way because it reminds me of chi, it reminds me of animal magnetism, also known as mesmerism, by the way, which was the forebearer of hypnosis uh, by the guy Mesmer. We haven't done an episode on him, yeah, but we definitely Mesmer. should. Um, interesting stuff for sure, but it's all about an invisible natural biomagnetic force, which I think everybody feels on some level and some people are more aware of it and others aren't. Yeah. It's so strange to think that like energy is everywhere. Obviously we are, we we are kind of batteries in a way we have produced a certain amount of electric energy. The idea that there is no way to manipulate that energy or that it's impossible to use it in, in something like pyrokinesis, harnessing that energy to focus it and for instance, start fire. Right. I mean, heal. I mean, I I don't see why it wouldn't be possible in some way. Yeah. Not that we know how to do it, but. Spoonbender. Spoonbender. Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin? I don't remember what his name was. Yuri Geller. Yuri Gagarin was the cosmonaut. Right. Yuri Geller was the spoonbender. We could do a whole thing on him. He was in the Matrix. Huh? That little bald kid. Remember? (laughs) The spoon? No, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, it was interesting. She, in her follow up, she said it was funny because in college, they, you know, you share a story when you're getting to know people, little mixer. And you tell a story of something that happened in your life. And she told this in her story. And she said it was funny because someone said, don't get Sonia angry. <laughs> Which she thought was funny because she also, she, I guess, is prone to nosebleeds like Firestarter. Oh, wow. Um, That's but, a good icebreaker for but she, ice melter. She got into working with Chi Energy later in life. And again, like this is, 
you know, depending on which culture you're looking at, this energy can be used for healing. It can also be destructive like fire. It's a fascinating thing. And I have a quick clip here. She had tried to find some corroboration on her own through her life after she had this experience and came across an old documentary. And this clip I want to play real quick is from a series of documentaries by Lawrence Blair called Ring of Fire, an Indonesian odyssey. And the subject in this clip is John Cheng. I first met him in the early 80s in a Chinatown of urban Java. He didn't want his real name or address revealed, so we called him DJ for Dynamo Jack. I've seen this before. It's pretty astounding. Yeah. He was only a healer, he said, but he did direct a powerful energy generated from his own body into his patients. Sometimes he used the needles, sometimes just his hands. He called the energy Qi, and it was so strong that he usually needed a grounder to hold his patient's feet. For years, we followed him around Java on his healing rounds, pleading to be allowed to film him. But he always refused, saying his powers resulted from a type of meditation with an ancient tradition of secrecy. It was only when my brother Lorne was suffering from a serious eye infection that he finally allowed us to film him in 1987. This is crazy. It was nothing like any acupuncture I'd ever had. I was getting really powerful electric shocks and couldn't control my movements at all. The way he touches that needle makes his hands move like that. Yeah. And we meet together, this can get uh, like electricity. Electric through the body. And is this because you're special? You have a special sort of uh, it's meditation every day. It's meditation that I do. Meditation every day. Like you can touch me like this. Just like this. That's nutty. <laughs> yeah. For our sound recorders, it was also a shocker. Just shock, shock the guy with that's his hand. That's like magic. Mm-hmm. Or burn the, the guy. Sound, sound lady. <laughs> that's so crazy. You now the sound lady is touching him and it's burning her, just from his belly. This is the craziest part, and this relates to our story. You guys got to check out this clip. He then took our newspaper outside and showed us how chi can also be used to set things on fire. Definitely do this clip for a live stream too. Mm-hmm. vibrating his hand intensely over the newspaper and he catches fire. Immediate combustion. On concrete, nothing underneath it. Newspaper they gave him. When he heard we'd shown this footage in public, he was very upset and refused all our future efforts to contact him again. Oh, wow. So it doesn't want publicity. As the years passed, we sadly resigned ourselves to never seeing him again. My brother Lorne never did, for by 1997 he was already dead when I again found myself with DJ, now treating me for an eye problem. Maybe we can stop it there. Um, Crazy. But it goes on, it's fascinating. Actually what makes this guy a believer, this documentarian, is how he heals his eye, or how he works on his eye. Yeah. We'll have that linked if you guys wanna check that out. Uh, there's also an awesome video by Robert Seffer on animal magnetism, we'll have that linked as That's well. That's great. This is far from the only evidence of oh, this yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, I've seen a lot of different things like this yeah. over my lifetime. Mm-hmm. I mean... And there are, I mean, just to be clear, because people are like, oh, you guys believe everything. But That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's our job. It's the belief hole. Critically. No, critically believe. But seriously, of course, there are people that do these kind of tricks, right? Oh, yeah. Magicians. I mean, a lot I'm, of charlatans. And you there. can't, obviously... That guy's not a trickster. He's, no, but I think the difference, I mean, you can, there's a lot of differences, but this guy was practicing... These people sought him out. He didn't want the attention, didn't want the footage shown when it did. He cut ties with them. And it, it just goes to a long line of healers really. healers and energy workers that he's following. Kind of interesting. It sounds like a more secretive kind of click of healers or a, tra- yeah. a secretive tradition. A mystery school. This goes back to ancient Egypt. That always does. Yeah. I mean, the stuff, it just it reminds me of Edgar Casey too, as far as anonymity, uh, not seeking the spotlight, not trying to make profit off of it. Yeah, and I don't know if this guy was charging or not. I know Probably. Edgar Casey didn't. I mean, if I could light stuff on fire, I'd charge a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty amazing. Anyways, check out the clip, guys. Decide for yourself. But yes. it's definitely fascinating. Well, thank you for sharing, Sonia. Yeah, thank you so much, Sonia. That's really, it, it's unique. We haven't had anything like that so far. So powerful story. Shall we move on to our next tale of intrigue? Let's, let's move along. Let's do it. <laughs> Jeremy, you want to introduce this one? Yeah, this story is fascinating and fairly creepy. This comes from our friend of the show, Rachel. It's a story of exploration into a discipline, like, for instance, lucid dreaming, and discovering something you might have wished you'd never seen. I call this The Grin. Recently, I went back listening to old episodes of your show to pass the time at work and got really sucked into the OBE and astral projection episode. As someone who experiences this sensation often, it really got me wondering if I could learn to control the phenomenon. So every night, 
I would lay down and try to enter that state, unfortunately to no avail, until one night recently. It happened in the middle of the night. I woke up, conscious, but couldn't move. My whole body was vibrating. At first I thought it was a night terror, but quickly reassured myself that it wasn't, and that I needed to remain calm. Then I started telling myself to just let go, detach, if you will. That's when I felt myself start to slip. I was moving down, but my body was still in the bed. It was weird because it was just happening in clips, like a glitchy animation. I just remember being on the floor looking around and then looking under my bed. This is the strange part. When I looked under my bed, there was a face there, smiling at me with an unnaturally large grin. It startled the crap out of me. I snapped back and instantly popped up. I shook everything off and laid back down and eventually drifted off back to sleep. Now for the extra weird part. Skip forward two days. Today is March 9th, and my three-year-old is telling me about how she was scared in the room the other night and that the dark really scares her. I reassured her that nothing would get her and I would fight off all of the big nasties that came snooping. I kid you not, she looked at me and said, Like you did the other night with a monster under your bed? When I tell you my stomach jumped into my throat, how could she have known? I was shocked, but it felt like validation in a way. Anyways, keep up the good work and thanks for providing a space for us beliefflings out there. With much love, Eidolon, Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you, Rachel. Yikes. So did she question her daughter more on that? Oh, about like what exactly did you like, say? How, did, you know how did she know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I would have been like, how did you know that? Yeah. Maybe she didn't want to scare her daughter by asking more about the monster under the bed. Mm -hmm. You know, usually you're like, makes don't worry, the monster is not Yeah, there was a, real. I don't remember if it was her story or someone else that we talked about recently. Actually, I think it was on the live stream, but the same thing where someone, oh, it was a Sheila's story on the live stream. Remember in her story, she said that in one example, her daughter, she was putting her daughter down and saw that she saw this shadow person appear in her daughter's bedroom and she freaked out and told the thing to leave. But of course, when her daughter became scared, she said, oh, I thought I saw somebody coming. Right. No yeah, one was here. No, that makes sense. You don't want to scare them too much. Well, you know, it reminds me of the hypnagogic state. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about this when you see those faces sometimes. Oh, right before the edge of sleep. Out of nowhere, right between sleep and wakefulness, you can see these monstrous visages, these faces. Of just, or just random people. Or random people. Very detailed. Very detailed. Very not defined. Always, not always scary. Yeah. And they're people that you've never, at least consciously have yeah. never seen before. They're just faces. And it just reminds me of like, why, why don't you see like scenes of parks? I mean, occasionally you can drift into a, a vision of that. I do that too. Yeah. But it's very detailed. Yeah. It's just like. And they're always up close. Yeah. And you're right by, exactly. Right. Very close. And it's right before you fully drift off. Right. You're right in that weird state. But I just have vistas, just very detailed things that I'm like, it's hard to imagine. My brain is just coming up. Creating with this. that for you? You're seeing the astral plane. Yeah, that's what it seems like. If you listen to, I actually recently watched an old interview with Robert Monroe, who you'll remember came up with the binaural beat process after he was having unending out-of-body experiences as a younger person and developed that through the, his work with radio broadcasting. But he says that everybody does this. Everybody at that stage right. of sleep, the hypnagogic, or, or when you get to the Delta part, everyone, even if they don't remember, is leaving their body mm. and having these astral projections or having out of body experiences. It's like a natural state of being. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting. When she sees this thing under the bed, it just reminds me of, you hear about sometimes run-ins with things on this other plane of existence. Yes. And she doesn't know that this thing is there until she's just shifted a little bit into this other dimension and then there it is. Yeah. I do think that the hypnagogic state, this kind of, uh, I don't know, etheric umbra between worlds, I think it's pregnant with these <laughs> astral beings and entities. And coming up very soon, we're going to hear something which may be a visitation from an astral parasite. It's never fun, though, when they're unpleasant. No, absolutely not. And it's fat. Well, I guess I should say this for when it's coming up, but I do think that there are these things, if this is all real, if you choose to believe or are open minded to it, that there are things on this kind of astral plane, just like anywhere else in life and nature, that they are just going about their day. They might be yeah. feeding <laughs> on us, but they are... It's part of their daily process. Yeah, they might... Taking a sip from Jerry. an astral worm, which we might be hearing from coming up here, uh, is not necessarily with evil intent. It is... Right. It's, it's job... Like we talked about the love slug on the live... Was that the live stream? Your hypothetical slug that feeds on your love? Right. A positive version yeah. of the, the nightmare feeder, the, you know, darkness eater. 
But that idea that, Love that they're just going about their job, their job is to break down energy in different ways on right. the astral plane. Sometimes you could get parasites just like we do in the physical world, which some people believe is a uh, response to what's happening on the astro- in the astral world. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily demonic in those kinds of situations. It could just be a very unfortunate situation where things are feeding on you because that's that's what they do there and you just are a lightning rod. Interdimensional bacteria. Exactly. So <laughs> stick around for that. That's coming up, but that that just ties in nicely. Yeah. But I hope that that's not what's happened to you. Uh, let us know, Rachel, if, if that is gone from you, unless the grinning became a more friendly. Well, she's had ongoing experiences. Last oh, thing I was, right. The very last thing I was going to say about that was just that all that rings so familiar, the the vibration, the slipping yep. down your body, down on the floor. Like yep. my experience is similar to that. And so many people out there that they don't even know what it is until they, I mean, now I think it's it's talked about more, but when I had mine, it was like I had to search and search online. And this is the beginning of the internet. Couldn't find anything for like two weeks until finally I found this vibration keyword yeah, without a body. So yeah. common. Yeah. So common. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Fascinating story. What's on deck? John, let's do one of the ones you had picked out for this episode. Oh, yeah. Um, let's do the devilish grimace. All right, let's stick with some grin. Goes right along the theme. Yeah, so this is Kayla's story. She was experimenting a little bit with lucid dreaming and kind of these altered states. And she had a very kind of disturbing experience that has to do with an uncontrolled body response. Interesting. Mm. Weird again with the pattern. Right. Practicing. Yeah, we're getting all these journeys. astral stuff for this episode. Yeah. It was totally random. Yeah, we all picked our own stories too. It always happens this way. It must be meant to be shared. Here we go. A few years ago, my husband, though at the time we were only dating, started to teach me the principles of lucid dreaming, a concept I have previously been unaware of. This is the idea of putting oneself to sleep while keeping the brain aware so that one can be active in one's dreams. My husband likes to use this practice to solve problems. I cannot speak for anyone else's experience, only my own. But for me, this feeling is a strange one. I can feel my eyes moving and all of my muscles relax, so that I know that I'm asleep, but it feels like I'm wide awake. While I was first trying to teach myself how to do this, I would try to wake myself back up so that I could make myself fall asleep again, something that I am not very good at since I have problems falling asleep most nights. Lucid dreaming helps me to fall asleep faster which is another reason I wanted to keep this practice. Hmm. The only time that I was able to practice waking up and putting myself to sleep multiple times was the strangest occurrence of my life. That night, my husband had gone out of town to help his mom with some chores and errands around her house. She lives about an hour away from us, so I knew that he would be back late. While he was gone, I decided to practice putting myself to sleep and waking back up. I achieved this by setting an alarm for myself so that I could start the process over again. I laid down on our couch next to our dogs Romulus and Remus. Both are different shepherd mixes, extremely protective and also extreme mama's boys. They were laying beside me on the couch and only seemed mildly annoyed by the alarm going on and off while I practiced. However, the last time I put myself to sleep, I feel as if I maybe opened myself too much because all of a sudden, my lips started pulling back into this devilish grimace. My face would relax and then do this again. I can't remember if any other part of my body was moving, but I can for certain remember that my lips were pulled back into this snarl. When I did that a few times, my younger dog, Remus, got up and started barking at me. The kind of barking that he only does when my husband and I are play fighting and kissing. And the barking is aimed at my husband. Mm. In the eight years that I have cohabitated with this dog, he had only ever barked at me like this on this occasion. It's creepy. As my lips started curling up, he would not stop barking at me until I got up off the couch and was fully awake. The part that was even stranger was that even after I woke up and walked into our bathroom to look at myself in the mirror, my lips were still doing that snarl. I would try to relax my lips and it would just naturally go back into that devil snarl. For several minutes this continued and then it stopped. At the time I tried to rationalize what had happened. 
The explanation that I came up with at the time was that it must have been a weird reaction to drinking some margaritas a little earlier in the day, <laughs> that the bitter aftertaste had made my body react this way. But I have never had the same reaction when I've simply fallen asleep after drinking some since then. As the years have gone past and I have replayed this night over and over in my mind, I have come to believe that I was almost possessed by some sort of demon or devil. Jeez. That is super creepy. <laughs> Very visual. Like you yeah. can just see like your your lip like curling up. You're just yeah. like trying to put it back down and it just keeps happening. Something is inside Yuck. you. Well, it sounds like if this was a while ago, years have passed and she replays this night. So it's not happening anymore. Thank God. I wonder if she, did she say she stopped experimenting after that? I don't know. We'll have to ask her. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. I mean, I think she would probably would have mentioned if she had made progress in lucid dreaming. I'd either stop that or I'd stop drinking margaritas. <laughs> One of those two. <laughs> Ew, tequila. No, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'll stick with my blue goo. It's interesting. I don't know if we talked about this on an earlier episode, but I I had read it and had planned on talking about it. Do you remember discussing recent findings they've had in scientific studies with lucid dreaming? Communication from the dream state to the conscious state? This is super fascinating. And apparently I always thought everybody believed that the lucid dreaming occurred because I think we've all had experiences where we knew we were dreaming. Yeah. There are people that have never had that experience and those people... Uh, it hadn't been proven scientifically. Losers. <laughs> Unfortunate <laughs> losers. It's an incredible sensation when you're in there. You, I've had them throughout my life. They're pretty rare. Yeah. And you they get to do rare. whatever you want most of the time. But usually your brain tries to trick you into forgetting that you're asleep. Yeah. It'll change the scene, right. which is always fascinating to me. It's almost like there's an adversary within your mind. It's like you're supposed to not know. Right. Yeah. It's like you're circumventing the game. Exactly. We have one that can see. It's interesting. The studies that have come out, I don't have it prepared, so I'm not going to get super into it. But basically, the one that I had read initially was that this guy had tried to prove that he was having lucid dreams. And he was a scientist working in a lab setting. And so he ended, he came up with a strategy that he would move his eyes in the dream state, look around. Because, you know, when you're dreaming, your eyes follow what you're doing in your dream, the rapid eye movement, REM. So he told his lab assistant, I'm going to, when I'm in a dream state, I'm going to sleep here. We're going to do these studies. When I get into a lucid state, I'm going to signal by moving my eyes so many times left and right. And then you'll know that I'm aware or whatever. And they worked this out. That's, that's right. really weird. And it worked. And now, and I just pulled this up from science.org and I'll have this in the show notes. That's so crazy. But there's, it's even more now where they had a whole group of people doing these studies where they asked them like 150 questions. And then the responses turned out that it was 18% uh, responded correctly to these questions that were asked. Questions that they could respond to by yes or no, basically by moving their eyes or smiling or frowning. Um, and they set this up ahead of time. 3.2% of the questions gave the wrong answer. So 18% correct, 3% wrong, 17% were not clear, and 60% didn't respond. So it proved basically that it is possible to communicate from the dream state, from the lucid dream state to the conscious. It's just very difficult. Yeah. But it's just interesting, like the, the whole dream technology thing, we're at the very beginning stages of this this idea. Where are we going to be yeah, if wonder, we keep pursuing this? You know? With technology advancing too, like how that will yeah, integrate. play out. It'd be nice to see if we had more of this, more discovering our own abilities as, right. as human beings, conscious, you know. Technology and the metaphysical world coming together. Right. I'd like to boost more of the, the spiritual side and pause on the technology a little bit. So I imagine like our, you know, those civilizations that have come and gone that we don't even see remnants of anymore. If you believe in like the ages that have come and gone with those civilizations that have come and gone, were maybe more spiritual, less technological. Right. But then maybe not. Maybe that's yeah, why they're all gone. Or Lemuria. Maybe they destroyed themselves like we might do, you know. Yeah, with Tinder apps and... <laughs> what were you saying, Sean? Maybe we slow down on that side, like, you know, chip implanting or whatever, right. and maybe use some of that technology to understand more about our latent human Potential. spiritual abilities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Before we move on, I just to go back to the creepy aspect of this that we kind oh, of yeah. glossed over, we talked a long time ago about doing an episode on like the spirits and spirits or like the potential of demonic possession or even through alcohol, through alcohol. <laughs> and I, the, the margarita thing is interesting because I do think that there's a potential and I've experienced this before where you feel a darkness that comes mm -hmm. in. If you, you know, drink too much or you're doing certain, especially the foolproof liquor I feel like. Yeah. I, I do think you can be open to that stuff. Not to say that you shouldn't do those kinds of things in moderation, but I definitely have been in weird places in my life. I think we all have. Yeah. And consuming alcohol say, and emotional, uh, it mm -hmm. doesn't feel like you sometimes. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes if you, I remember a specific experience where I was looking into the mirror and just staring at myself and feeling this kind of warm, I don't want to say power, but it was like, a, <laughs> it's, it, warm was, power. it was like something I was drawn to kind of like the feeling you get when you're going to scare somebody. This kind of yeah. like dark joy 
I guess you right. can call it. And I was Dude, I started smiling and it just reminds <laughs> me of the story a little bit. But I do wonder the combination of depending on how much she had to drink early on and then moving into the lucid dreaming practice while having consumed that and maybe being open a little more lubricated to the astral yeah. plane. It you creates know, holes in your aura. Alcohol does. It opens up whatever protective barrier. This is how I view it. Right, right. And it's not to say that you're going to be possessed. Not to say she was drinking too much. Yeah, I just think alcohol in general, it just opens up your protective barrier for whatever these things are, whether they're energies or other yeah. dimensional beings, but it just kind of leaves you a little bit more exposed. Just like, in, you know, in the waking life, you know, or in, the, in our regular cognition, same kind of idea. Like you're lubricated, you're more open to ideas. But I think, yeah, that can definitely transfer in your, into your etheric self. But if you stick with Miller Lite or gas station vodka, you're fine. I think you're probably more likely. <laughs> <laughs> that's just because that's what you drink. It's just light alcohol. You, they can't get you as much. They, they should make a you. brand called Gas Station Vodka. I'm working on it. Dude, is, sorry, is that what happened in Poltergeist? Remember when he's drinking tequila, oh, tequila. and he drinks the worm? <gasps> what a synchronicity, because we have a story about an astral worm coming up. But that's the right. idea, the, didn't well, that, that possess weird. him or yeah, something that happened? that was a disturbing part oh, of the Oh, I forgot movie. about that. Ooh, weird Was that the sequel or was that the first one? Oh, Coach. She's great. I think that might have been the first one. You guys will know out there and you'll, we'll get a thousand emails. That was a freaky movie when it, when it came out, I remember. I've been wanting to watch that again recently. I haven't seen it in like a decade. And if you guys are interested in learning more about that movie and the real life occult goings ons behind the making of the film, definitely check out our expansion episode we did on cursed film sets and haunted yes, movies. Such as Poltergeist, The Exorcist, and uh, even some Bruce Lee stuff in there. And The Omen. Bruce Lee stuff was really fascinating. We covered in depth. Be water, my friend. Oh, so great. Go, Bruce. All right, should we jump into our next tale? <laughs> Let's do one of our speak pipes. And if you guys want to submit a story with your own voice, telling it in your own words, yeah, just go to bleefhole.com and click on listener stories and then share your story and we will receive it. You'll have the option to write in a story through the form or record your own. Do they have the option of sharing pictures and stuff through there? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys, if you have any media that goes along with that video, audio, a signed document that states your story is true, you can <laughs> upload that on, in the form along with your, either your speak pipe that you could send separately or with your written account in the form there. So definitely yeah. go to believeful.com, click on list of stories and then share your story. You can also record your own account if you have the gear to do that and you want to upload it right to the website. Absolutely. Via our email. But this is the best way to get us just any written stories through the form. So this story comes to us from our friend Christian in Sweden, our listener and friend out there, and I call it Dancing Swedish Spheres. Ready? Let's do it. So this happened sometime in the mid-1990s in a small village where I grew up in northern Sweden. By small, I mean a village with a population close to around 12,000 people. The nearest city is a good 45 minute drive away, and it was winter time, and there was snow everywhere. The air was very crisp and fresh this evening. My mother and I were driving home from the supermarket after doing some shopping, a drive which takes about 10 minutes or so. Between the actual village and the clusters of houses in the outskirts, there are quite a few farming fields and smaller grass plains and it's all surrounded by wilderness, woods and mountains. As we were driving down the small road to the residential areas where our house was, I noticed something in the sky above the grass field to the right of our car. The grass field was, of course, now covered with snow. This night was a starry night, well around wintertime, the sun sets around 3 p.m. in our part of the world, wow. so it wasn't unusual with the early stars. I believe it was closer to 7 p.m. when this happened. So we pulled the car to the side and stopped to have a better look. At first I thought it was the navigation lights of an aeroplane. I also know what a shooting star looks like and northern lights look like. And this was neither. What I saw was one green sphere and one red sphere flying around in circles. It was almost like they were chasing each other. And they were fast too. Mind you, this was well before the time of drones. These spheres flew around silently and much more gracefully than any drone. I also remember the colors reflecting in the snow below. 
That's cool. And um, yeah. the entire display or show or what you would call it didn't last more than a minute at tops before they ascended in the night and disappeared. But luckily, my mother saw it all too, so I know I didn't imagine things. To this day, I still don't know what it was. As a Christian, I'm obviously a bit biased in my, my worldview and on how things operate in both the physical and unseen world, but I can't unsee what I saw back then, so I'm a bit more open to the notion that there are more things between heaven and earth than we might realize. Absolutely. Well said. Good story. Yeah. Great story. The yeah. visual of that where the spheres are chasing each other and the, the colors, the glow is reflecting in the snow. Yeah. It's just such a cool visual. Well, it adds that aspect that it's not something far away in the sky. Right. You're actually seeing a reflection on the, the earth beneath you from the yeah. snow. I mean, that's... Yeah. You can't be too far away. Yeah. And it's just such a beautiful... I don't know. His voice too helps with the... Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic perfect voice. storytelling voice. And the corroboration with his mom, the, or the fact that she was there to be their yeah. witness as well as him, it, it also helps as he grows up to not remember it differently. Like, oh, maybe it didn't happen. She was there to see it. Did he said silent too, right? Which to me is That's like... so weird. They're silent and they're low enough to be seeing the reflection in the snow, obviously before drones as well. Right. I was going to say easily, like a, my drone would have red and green lights, but there weren't drones then. Right. Think of like an, even an airplane flying low. You, you're not going to see the blinking light reflected in the snow. And they wouldn't be chasing each other, right. the lights, independently. Yeah. Fascinating story. You hear that story a lot. Our friend Brian, who told his tale, will do one day when I can edit that monster down. But it's the same sort of thing that the spheres chasing each other. That was in the Upper Peninsula of oh, Michigan. Right. But again, these two chasing each other back and forth, different colors, moving around quickly. They're playing. Yeah. My wrote, vote is Sky Creature. Ah, these maybe. organic life forms that live in the it's bioluminescence in the air above us with bioluminescence. It, that would explain the silence, the silent propulsion. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. definitely interesting. Um, what's really a bummer? I wanted to try to find some corroboration in Sweden around this time period, mm -hmm. but MUFON, as we discussed earlier, Jerry, I think you you came oh, across this. Right. They're behind a paywall now, so the research is a little more challenging. Membership. Yeah. We should probably get. I mean, one it's of not those. too much, but things, yeah, I was torn. Part of me was disgruntled by that, and the other part of me is like, well, I'm sure they could use the money for paying administrators and researchers and stuff. Yeah, for the servers and stuff. I think before that, they just had the fee to sign up to be a, uh, a moufonier. A moufonier, yeah. yeah. Which, I, by the way, I have the application for that. So we can pick up our own cases in the area. Oh, so if someone witnesses a UFO nearby, we get called first. Yes. Well, that's cool. <laughs> We're like a node on the network. Exactly. That's right. that's right. Let's node it up. Working together to prove the existence of extraterrestrial life or just UFOs. Or at least keep track. On that note, you guys want to take a quick break? Yeah, let's introduce uh, what's coming up on this week's expansion. Oh, yes. Let's do it. On this week's expansion, guys, get ready and buy your ticket. <laughs> buy your ticket. <laughs> Sounds exciting. Your ticket to ride the train tracks of terror. <laughs> That's what we're doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds interesting. You were excited about that idea last time we talked about no, it. No, I, I thought that it was going to be hard to find stuff. That's what I thought, but Chris dove in. I and did he, some digging last night. He conducted his own investigation. Ooh, he conducted it. That's oh, right. nice. Good pun. He caught it. So, yeah, train tracks of terror, uh, railways to elsewhere. I've got some interdimensional stories in railway stations. Ooh, I like that title. And um, I want to find at least one account from the beginning of the Iron Horse where someone was traveling through the wooded lands across the virgin landscape of America or Europe somewhere and uh, where they see something in the forest. That's, that's my goal to find one of those or a couple of those because I don't have any of those yet. You're still preparing, but we do have stories from conductors themselves of strange things witnessed. And yes, tales, as you said, to elsewhere other dimensional connections. Yes, I finally get to dive into the story I touched on in our animal expansion, our bizarre animal expansion. I think that was the one, but I mentioned yeah. Salvador Dali and the railway station that he believed was an interdimensional gateway. I'm going to get into that tale. All right, so enjoy this preview. Enjoy the preview. And if, I think, how many episodes do we have on our expansion channel now? 50 something? 50? Yeah. A lot of extra content, guys. So sign up if you're interested and enjoy the uh, preview. Yeah, you get one of these expansion episodes every time we drop a regular one. So enjoy this preview for train tracks of terror and railways to elsewhere. Dig it. Techie, techie, let's take a yawn over the ocean, huh? Let's go to Japan. You guys ready? Let's go. I'm ready. This is the tale of Techie, techie. Now, Teki Teki is a Japanese 
urban legend about a vengeful spirit, which is a common, I think, trope in Japanese folklore. It's called an onryo. That's a vengeful spirit. Now, this is something you might experience in train stations at night. This is where this thing lurks, allegedly. And that name, teke, teke, that comes from the sound that its hands and elbows make as it drags its torso across the ground because it's missing its lower half. Pretty creepy, huh? Yeah. Now, there's a background to this. If teke, teke catches you, she'll cut you in half with her well, on some legends, she has a scythe, like a reaper. Here's one of the legends. There's many legends, you know, like any urban legend, there are different versions. This is a primary one. There are a number of threads in common between many of the variations of the legend, and the most common one points towards a woman from Hokkaido named Kashima Reiko. One legend states, in the years after World War II, an office worker in Muroran, Hokkaido, was assaulted and raped by American military personnel. That night, she leaped off a bridge onto the railroad tracks and was hit by an oncoming train. The impact was so forceful that her body was torn in half at the waist. The severe cold of the Hokkaido night caused her blood vessels to contract and prevented her from bleeding out quickly. Instead, she squirmed and wriggled about for help for several minutes. She crawled all the way to the train station and was seen by an attendant. Instead of trying to help her, the station attendant just covered her with a plastic tarp. She died a slow, agonizing death. And according to legend, three days after hearing this story, you will see the ghost of a woman with no lower half. So get ready, guys, and everyone out there, because you've heard it. The ghost is that of a woman hit by the train. She will ask you a riddle. Now, this is important to know in case this happens to you. She'll ask you this riddle either in a dream or in a mysterious phone call. Hello? The only way to escape death is to answer her question exactly the right way. She will ask you, quote, Do you need your legs? You must reply, I need them right now. Then she will ask you, Who told you my story? You must reply, Kashima Reiko. Ka as in mask, she as in death, ma as in demon, re as in ghost, and ko as in accident. If you answer her riddles without mistake, she may just let you live. I'm not going to remember that. She may? <laughs> she may. <laughs> well, All that work. I'm not going to take the time for a maybe. A maybe. Hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome back. Welcome into the mysterious belief hole where we're going to regale you with more tales of strangeness. And to begin the second half of this episode, we will be doing another one that John has procured from our endless bin of strange tales. Who's this from, John? Oh, this is from Lena. Well, this is the one with the orbs, right? It is. Oh, this ties into the other lucid dreaming story. This is an experience Lena had where it's like a series of events that kind of builds up to this I don't want to give it away, yeah. but this experience she has upon from waking and it's a... Uh, Definitely in the high strangeness. A though. shocking revelation. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely bizarre. This is one of the most bizarre. This reminds me, it's very cinematic, almost like Poltergeist, like we talked about before, where there is this crescendo of activity. Right. And it's interesting because it seems like Poltergeist activity at the beginning, but it kind of leads to this almost sci-fi thing. Yeah. Interesting. This is a story about strange activity and a floating orb. In 2014, my husband and I were living in a newly built home in a suburb of Georgia. During the time that we lived there, a series of very odd events took place. The first event was when my mom was visiting from out of town. We spent the day out at the mall, during which time my phone was stolen. Mom, have you seen my phone? When I arrived home and tried pushing the front door open, it felt as if someone was on the inside pushing back. On top of that, my mom and I both heard footsteps coming down the stairs. This naturally made me nervous, yeah. especially since my phone containing my personal info had been stolen, so I called the cops. But of course, when they arrived, nothing was out of the norm. On another occasion, my husband and I were downstairs and heard a loud crashing sound coming from upstairs, as if a large picture had fallen off the wall. 
Though we both looked around, we found nothing out of place, even in the attic. In another case, I was laying in bed facing the master bathroom doorway, and just as I opened my eyes upon waking, the door immediately slammed shut. Another evening, I was taking a shower in the master bathroom, and as I was rinsing my hair, I heard a whooshing sound as if the glass shower door had been opened. Ugh. So I opened my eyes thinking my husband had opened it, but nobody was there. During this period, I was also having more dreams involving sleep paralysis and was feeling very uneasy, specifically in the master bedroom. So I started doing some research online into sleep paralysis. A day or so later, when my husband and I were laying in bed, he began dozing off, and just as he did, he instantly started yelling out in fear. When I woke him, he said that he was dreaming a giant spider was coming down off the ceiling towards me. I hadn't told him that I was looking into sleep paralysis, which apparently often results in people seeing giant spiders coming down a web towards them in their bed. It was even more strange that the spider was coming towards me instead of him, since he was the one dreaming it. All of this culminated to one morning, sometime later, when I was in bed alone. It was just beginning to be daylight, and my husband was down in the kitchen. I was abruptly awoken to a bright white flash of light that appeared through my completely shut eyes. However, when I opened my eyes, the light was just normal, soft, morning light. I closed my eyes to rest some more, and right away another white flash went off. This time I jumped out of bed and looked out the window wondering if maybe an ambulance was outside or a storm with lightning was coming in. But there was absolutely nothing to explain the phenomenon. So I laid back down once more, closed my eyes, and bang, the white light went off again. This time when I opened my eyes, the situation was anything but normal. Above me, there was a silently floating red orb of light. I just laid there looking at it. I wasn't scared and I didn't feel paralyzed like I normally would with sleep paralysis. I just laid there looking at it and it stayed in place seemingly looking back at me. The orb was about the size of a basketball and it appeared like a tangled mess of red laser light. Weird. After about 10 seconds or so, it moved towards a closed window to the right of my bed and made its way out through the glass in a wave-like form. Strange. After that experience, my husband came home from work one day and mentioned that his coworker was talking about having to burn sage in his basement because his son, who was living in the basement, said that he saw a floating ball of light. I can't be sure what was going on in my home. My brother had passed away the year prior and things didn't seem to start up until my mom visited. But hearing that someone else saw an orb in the same area makes me wonder what it possibly could have been. Great story. That is so bizarre, man. Because I, I know it's definitely synchronicity with these stories aligning today randomly. Yeah, they're all very intertwined. The freaking orb, the red basketball-sized tangled laser light orb, could be the glowing proboscis on the head of an astral worm. Because it sounds crazy, but <laughs> later... Nah, it sounds pretty normal to me. Later coming up, we have a worm, astral worm story from Doug from Canada, and it starts off the same exact way, this glowing but Don't be spoiling light. it. I'm just give, giving a little connection of what's coming up because the connection is just bizarre. That people seem to see these things that seem to be maybe coming from the astral plane, maybe not, but they're identified by a light or orb. Yeah. But what is behind that? Orb on the maybe only seen in the astral. Maybe the light is just a representative of what is beyond this plane. What is out there all around us all the time? So weird. The lucid dreaming connection again with all these out of body experiences, astral plane stuff. That is a common precursor to the out of body experience. Is the beginnings of lucid dreams having them for a couple of weeks before you start to have the slipping from your body. Yeah, that's what was happening to me. Was the regular lucid dreams. That's common for people. The astral, um, the spider thing that was seen was that her child yeah. seeing it climbing down on her husband. Husband, Husband yeah. sorry. I've had that experience with just, you know, the waking hypnagogic state with these giant spiders. And people talk about astral spiders. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, this just ties in because I had this prepared for Doug coming up with the worm. But um, this comes from a self-proclaimed pagan witch's website about astral travel and astral planes and what she's dealt with over there. I think it's a she, it might be he. I'll just read the short quote. I've perceived astral parasites a few different ways. The most common parasites that I see are what look like little slugs, leeches, 
slowly squirming around the auric field, there's also spider-like, crab-like parasites which move a bit faster. The more stubborn parasites are the ones that I perceive as having tentacles. These tentacles begin reaching in past the aura and into the physical body. I usually see this as going towards the genitals or the heart area. Weird. So two most important places. That's weird. In the human body. But I, the, I think that what stuck out to me was just the the spiders, mm-hmm. and then the leeches, worms, slugs, because we have something coming up that this could lead right into that if we want to. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, thank you for that story, Lena. Yeah. Thank you, Lena. Thank and you so much. Lena. This season we're going to be exploring this astral realm because I've got a couple of really good books on this. Let's do it. All right. Well, let's dig right into the astral with Doug from Canada. This one's called the worm. Well, the the night worm cometh, or what did you call it? Oh, I just like <laughs> yeah, something like that. But I just changed it to the worm. Oh, really? It was, uh, the worm comes at night. That's better. Okay. I woke up one night with the sense of something being in the room with me. I was laying on my side, and when I opened my eyes, I saw a small orange light, like the ember on a cigarette, in the air in front of my face. That's what I was convinced it was. It was slowly getting closer, and I was sure it was going to come into painful contact with my eyeball. At some point, I realized I couldn't smell cigarette smoke. This must be something else. At that point, its form was revealed to me. It appeared like a giant, segmented, transparent worm. Reared up cobra style. Weird. And the orange light was on the front of its head. I didn't feel fear. I was observing the scene with a detached interest. And then I felt extremely tired like I'd been shot with a tranquilizer dart, and my eyes slid shut as sleep took over. This whole event didn't take long. I'd estimate 20 to 30 seconds. I've never heard a similar report and wonder if you gents can shed some light on this. Much love from Canada. Doug. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Not to scare you, but something astral's feeding off of you. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's no, just trying to make suggestion. Friends. Yeah, I mean... There's a weird little aspect at the end there where it put him to sleep. Yeah, quiet now. Quiet, I must continue my yes. breaking down of your auric field for my feeding That's my weird. my larvae. Yeah, hopefully not. Sleep now. I hope you haven't experienced sleep. anything negative, Doug. Sleep. <laughs> very strange, very, you know, it's unique, but it has these threads that tie in. So, um, by the way, a segmented worm is a, an annelid. What is that? That's. I just wonder if there's a name for that, segmented worm. What do you mean? Like it has little rings around it? Yeah, the ringed the ringed? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's they're called annelids. The segmented Oh, I worm. thought you meant the word itself was an annelid, like some sort of No, no, uh, no. Noun. That's the name. That's the kind of uh, worm it is. But the reason I want to know is because I was this is another theme too is I was looking specifically for segmented worm-like astral entities and using that extra keyword helped me find one. Ooh. Uh that actually comes from the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Awesome. There is a gentleman by the name of Thoth Rises on TripAdvisor from Richmond, Virginia, but he had an experience there. And in his review, he wrote, Then, during the 11 p.m. flashlight tour of the children and adolescent unit, my phone cam inadvertently caught a ghostly entity resembling a foot-long luminescent segmented worm, not visible to the naked eye, hovering in a patient's room. I was taking pics of the original bulletin board showing the historic 1122-1994 doors closed sign. I discovered the entity later when downloading pics I've ruled out logical explanations and believe this is an authentic, anomalous spiritual entity existing in a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum not visible to human eyesight. There we go. Disincarnate human demon astral wildlife? iPhone 4S cam flash off and taking pics using small flashlight. Segmented worm entity was not flashlight beam, not reflection, and not in the hallway where the bulletin board was located, but in a dark room off the hallway. Analysis indicates the entity is composed of a different type of light than the flashlight and ambient light. Nobody else was on the floor when I took pics. I was totally alone in the dark. Since it was totally silent and no other living humans were on the floor, when I took the photo, I can rule out lights from the guide and other tour members. Interesting. So it sounds like a similar thing, only captured in camera. Yeah. Like we see these things captured in camera all the time, but maybe some people sometimes, depending on what's going in the auric field shifting, the etheric umbra, maybe sometimes people can actually see these things yeah. in the moment. Of course, the skeptical view would be uh, people who are seeing these at night, spiders, worms, people's darkest fears. In the hypnagogic state, you're seeing this stuff. Right. But I choose to think that it's more likely that there are creatures all around us all the time that we can't see. Yeah. Why not? They're in the three-dimensional world. That's right. Exactly. And the fact that they're patterns, the fact that they are... Right. There's, yeah. 
there's a belief too, and I'll have links to this stuff in the show notes, but the idea that the physical parasites that we have in our bodies and stuff are minions of the astral, the larger etheric entities. Yeah, it's going a little far. Because they feed on our anguish, our pain, our suffering. And what's happening in the astral or in your energetic field on the other plane or whatever can over time break down elements of your health which can then feed that parasite more in the mm. astral because you're suffering. It's kind of an interesting concept. Um, if you have astral parasites and you're seeing getting rid of them, we'll have links in the show notes of uh, we, different, different we ways. We have a course actually we're selling. <laughs> <laughs> we are not affiliates of these people, but there's some interesting information out there. And there's one, I'm not going to read the story, but I just wanted to mention this. There was a guy on Reddit uh, and we'll link to that in the show notes, but he's been dealing with this for a while. Apparently he considered himself a, uh, a practitioner of ceremonial magic uh, of the uh, order of the golden dawn type mm-hmm. stuff. And he would do invocation spells in the morning and banishing spells in the evening. And he was doing them so regularly that he believes he had entities start attaching themselves to him, feeding off of his etheric energy. And he was basically having thoughts of violence and dark, dark. He said he couldn't feel anything anymore, right? He no lost emotions. All empathy, all emotion was gone, and he considered himself a really empathetic person, but he lost everything as far as, you know, emotional perceptiveness and feeling, and he didn't know what to do. So he spoke with an energy healer, I think it might have been a friend, but she basically worked on him. They did a, one of the, kind of like what you guys had that, uh, what was a Reiki mm-hmm. session? And when she said she was moving the energy into him or whatever, he got violently ill and went to the bathroom like he was going to throw up. Weird. And after that, these things were pretty much gone, like 90% gone. The, the theory was that the ceremony magic that he was doing every morning and night was creating a beacon of, of yes. light in the astral plane saying, come and come here. I'm, I'm available for your suckling or whatever. Yeah. And as that website I referenced earlier, the witch or whatever, she had mentioned specifically something on this, that astral parasites are exactly what they sound like, energetic entities that are parasitic in nature. They aren't necessarily malevolent any more than physical parasites, but just like physical parasites, they're not something we want and are harmful. They're all a part of a spiritual ecosystem, like you guys just mentioned. I liken them more to the creatures that are meant to break down excess pools of energy. When we begin ceremonial magic or what have you, or any other form of energy work, we begin to light up on the astral. To these creatures, it's like a moth to a flame. They're drawn to that energy and want to start breaking down and eating that energy. And that's what that guy had said on Reddit, a totally different person. I just thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Like there is this theme. It's not evil. It's just doing what it naturally does. Right. Right. And it can be very dangerous. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not like it's, when I think of something that's evil, I think of it it enjoys, it's like sadistic. It enjoys hurting. This is just like, it's the way it survives almost. Not to say there aren't evil things out there Yeah, I'm not saying that, but like it's no more evil than us killing a chicken to eat it. Yes. Vegetarians are like, that is evil, John. Yeah, well, I disagree. Um, I used to be vegan. I remember we were, we were raw vegans. I know. And I got really sick from it. Anyways, that's another topic. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it's just interesting to think about it from the standpoint of them just using it to sustain itself. Like there's, right. there's beings out there that just part of the food chain or whatever. Yeah. I think about all the beings in this planet that just feed off of, you know, breaking down organic matter. Exactly. And Worms, mosquitoes, and, yes. and bacteria ticks. Think about at, ticks. at the ugh. microscopic level. Yeah. Yeah. Ticks are just, ugh. they're dicks. Ticks, ticks or, or dicks. dicks. <laughs> That's a shirt. Hey, on that, on shirt. that note, <laughs> can we please make a shirt that says ticks, <laughs> ticks or dicks? <laughs> just like would, a, a tick, they're just like with attitude. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a Goodwill shirt you'd find. The tick, it's like putting gum under the, yeah. the table. But like not tipping the pizza Doesn't guy. Doesn't make right. any sense and no one, everyone's like, well, I guess that's true. Ticks are dicks. It's true, but I don't understand how that means anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're doing it. All right, let's go to, into our next tale. So this next story comes from Cass from Wabash, Indiana. Classic haunted tale. I won't get more into it. We'll just let it play and then we'll follow up afterwards. Awesome. This is called Devil and the Dumbwaiter. This happened about 25 years ago in historic downtown Wabash in a place called the Market Street Grill Restaurant. Yay! Thank you. (laughs) I set that up well. (laughs) All right, ready? Yeah, let's do it. Hey guys, my name's Cass. Uh, first of all, I just started listening to your podcast recently. I really enjoy it. You're doing a great job. I hope that you uh, keep it up. Yes. My story is from when I was a teenager. I lived in a small town in Indiana and I used to work in a restaurant in the historic downtown area. And it was in an old building. 
and the restaurant itself was on the the bottom floor and then the kitchen was on the second floor and there was a dumb waiter that went down to the first floor if we were delivering the food that was cooked or receiving dirty dishes back up and there was a like a bellhop at the top of the dumb waiter and so down below on the first floor it would light up with whatever number was pressed on the bellhop when we would send food down so you would have a list of the waitresses so you hit their number to send it down well one day a friend of mine went to work early to finish up washing dishes that were left over from the night before and it was just him and I there and we went down because the linens and stuff that got cleaned would be inside the atrium on the first floor and we went downstairs to grab the towels and stuff and as we were walking back in the bellhop was just going crazy like buttons pressing constantly you know bing 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 just kept going through all the numbers and we just thought somebody was up there messing with us so we headed up the stairs and as we round the corner and looked next to the dumb waiter there was no one standing there but the buttons were pressing by themselves and my buddy was like what the and as soon as he started to say it it just stopped Weird. there was a another night up on the second floor where the kitchen was they also had a catering area and there were tvs out there and my brother and I were sitting out there watching a game and the bathrooms for the catering area were at the back of the room. And we were standing there and someone started knocking at the door to the bathroom. I thought that was really weird. And I walked over there and I opened the door and I was looking around the bathroom, nobody was in there. So I started walking out and as soon as the door shut behind me, it knocked again. So I turned around and I was like, what the heck? And I knocked on the door just to be coy, and it started knocking again. And I swung the door open, there was nobody there. Freaky. That was really weird. The last thing that happened there was also up in the catering area. I had rolled a metal cart out, and I was doing some food prep, and there was a wood floor that was a little bit raised. It was a walkway that went back to where the bathrooms were. And I was sitting there just doing some food prep and I heard the bathroom door open up and just instinctively I looked to see who it was. There was no one there, but then footsteps start walking across the wood floor and they just start gaining speed faster and faster. And along the wall with that walkway, there are glass display cases that showed old saloon style scenes and stuff like that, just to kind of be an ambiance for that area, like it was an old saloon or something. And these steps started coming faster to the point where they were running. I just kind of froze. And then right when the steps got next to the display case that was four or five feet away from me, something banged on the glass really hard. I dropped what I was doing and just ran down and I clocked out and I never went back to work there because it freaked me out so bad. So those are my stories. Again, you guys are doing great. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to listening to the rest of your stuff. Creepy stuff. Thank you, Cass. Yeah. A multitude of things. So is this a famously haunted place? It Um, sounds like it should be. You know, I don't know. I don't know if there's uh, local lore about this place in particular. It's freaky to think, you know, when you get like a job somewhere and especially if it's an old place, people are going to tell stories and stuff. Well, his coworkers told him a little lore about the place that it had been previously a funeral parlor oh, and there you, go. you could even see downstairs, there was a bricked up part of the wall where a drive comes up to the, the basement on the outside. And uh, they said that's where the hearse would come in. Pick up from the mortuary or and from the morgue. Right? the hearse, when it was no longer a funeral parlor, the hearse had been bricked up inside and that no. his current boss, Bill had it disassembled when he took over before Cass started working there. So that was what he was dealing with that time was that legend, right? That yeah. you know, he wanted to know if that was true or not. He wasn't sure if they were pulling his leg, but to make that even freakier, the basement where he would have to occasionally go down and employees would have to go down into, it had one of those, uh, he called it like a tumble bell timer for the light switch. You know those uh-huh. where you yeah. turn the light on and it starts ticking. 
Oh yeah. And you have to make your way through the basement to get whatever you need <laughs> before, before it, it comes off. back and shuts off on you. And so he said he'd always have someone come down there and keep watch yeah. on the light switch. If that's true, it just, why would you brick up the hearse inside the building? Well, it turns out he did a little digging and even on the uh, website now for the, the restaurant, you can find this. But back in 1918, the building was being used by the W.P. Jones and Son, who were funeral directors. So there you go. Yeah. There's the basis for the legend. Uh, sadly, one of the sons, S.J. Payne, died on February 11th, 1924. The building changed hands multiple times after that eventually becoming the restaurant. But he died kind of traumatically by slipping and falling on ice. Oh, it's sad. But yeah, so there's definitely some foundation for that place being haunted. If you want to consider the idea yeah. that funeral parlors have an extra little spice when it comes to the spirit world. Well, thank you for submitting that story. Yeah, thanks, Cass. Great story. Right, we have one more for you for tonight. This is a unique tale. I call this Strange Recall from Parts Unknown. I'm from Oklahoma, but my first job out of college a few years ago was in Louisiana, in this little town in the middle of nowhere. I've always gotten along with people older than myself, and I became close buddies with another guy in my office who was about 55. He had a lot of crazy but true stories, but this one I'll never forget. Robert was just a good old boy with no reason to lie about this. He told me about his friend whose dad, in the 50s, went and bought a nice new sedan, Ford or Chevy, just a normal car. He filled it up and drove it, you know, as one does when you own a car. After a few days, he noticed the gas gauge hadn't changed. He drove a good bit, enough that he maybe should have half a tank or less. So he thought, well, dang, I'll just pop into my small town dealer and see if they can fix my gauge. As he sits there waiting for repair, the owner of the shop is acting a little peculiar, talking on the phone in a hushed voice. These men were at least more than acquaintances, so the shop owner didn't BS the guy. He pulled him in his office and said, effectively, that this car was never supposed to be in the hands of the public. It had all sorts of unidentifiable added parts to the engine. The reason his gas gauge hadn't moved is because it hardly burned any. So that equated to him getting over 100 miles to the gallon. The manufacturer ordered him to remove all those parts and send them back. That seems funny. Kind of indicative of how high trust society used to be. Can you imagine if this happened today? After that, the man's car consumed fuel as you would expect. No more 100 miles per gallon. Anyway, this may not be a conventional bleepful story. And it may not even be true. But I'd love to get it out there. Thanks, guys. Interesting. Yeah. I, love, I just love that story because it reminds you of like forbidden technology. Yeah. Water powered cars. Yeah. Right. What was that guy? Stan, Stanley? Stanley? Stanley Meyer. Stanley. <laughs> Stanley the comic book. <laughs> Stanley Meyer. Yeah. He was uh, murdered for his work on the water car. At least that's what it seemed like. Yeah. yeah I but, think that's definitely possible. Oh, absolutely. We don't go into the conspiracy stuff as much as we used to, but... Miss those days. When there's money to be made, you can guarantee that there's levels of planned obsolescence sort right. of things. I'm just wondering where this car came from. Yeah, that's what's interesting. Like, he got it by accident, and it had technology in it that it wasn't supposed to have for the modern consumer, <laughs> for the actually, regular consumer. So was this like a black budget, some sort of... That's what it sounds like. But it must be undercover, right? It certainly right? wasn't yeah. an accident. If it was getting 100 miles to the gallon, that wasn't right. just, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> we, we added something that just gave it extra 100... I mean, yeah. it doesn't make sense. It reminds me of a, a book that I read. I don't think I finished it a while back. I think it was called From a Buick 8. It was a Stephen King book, but it was about basically this guy somehow gets this car that has these abilities and it's all, I can't remember, it might be partially alive and it's not Christine, but it has these, this technology, uh -huh. but it's wrapped in this thing that has to do with other dimensionality. I should read that book again. I yeah. forget why I stopped reading it. But I will say that this technology, I do believe this stuff is out there. I worked on one for a while. The electrolysis process, I mean, science guys out there and gals be like, ah, oh, it doesn't really, it's not that effective. But I was working on it for a while because I was down the YouTube rabbit hole on this electrolysis kind of device, HHO, electric, basically separating the oxygen from the hydrogen in water and feeding that into your engine, the oxygen into your engine or something. Mm -hmm. I never finished it, but I have it half built. But I think it'd be awesome. To, but yeah. the idea is supposed to increase the efficiency to something like that. Pretty much, you can drive infinitely on water with just enough gas to start the engine in the first right. place. But it's fascinating. I'd love to do an episode sometime on that, on advanced suppressed technology, John. Yeah. I think it'd be fascinating. But I thought just a great story to end today's episode with, because it's just so unique. Absolutely. So hope you guys dug today's Strange Listener Stories episode. If you have any of your own strange tales that you'd like to submit, head on over to Bleeful.com. Yes! Yes.
All right, guys. Well, we have some new members to thank for supporting the show. Yeah. Yes. So we're going to do that now. And if you want to hear your name for now. Yay! Sign up to be an expansion member. Uh, go to bluefill.com, click on the big red button. You get bonus episode every time we drop one of these and uh, you help keep the show growing. Some bonus live streams, some That's bonus right. early episodes. Off the cuff conversations. There's good. There's a fair amount of content on there. So if you're hungry for the whole, uh, come on over and munch down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you too. Welcome to be here. Steven Johansson. Hey, buddy. Or Johansson. Welcome in. Come on down. Good friend of the show. Yeah, I recognize that name. Welcome to be here, David Waters. Ooh, oh, yes. well, that's yes. stream any day. Get in. <laughs> Rochelle, thank you for being in the hole. Rochelle, Rochelle, you are swell. Yes. <laughs> Get out your gun and put out the bait for Ryan Hunt, because yes. he's in the hole. Ryan Hunt is on the hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Careful that rhyme. Awesome. <laughs> Steve Spencer, it's good to see you, brother. Yes. Thanks for supporting the show. Yes. Steve, boy, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Would you like some more? You'll get some with Jacob more because he's here in the hole supporting the leaf uh, hole. Can't get enough Jacob. Jacob is the best. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice addition. <laughs> thank you to Marade, Maradi Alexander. I didn't pronounce that right. Mm. Welcome in, Maradi. Welcome to the hole. Thank you for being here and steering your... Attitude towards us. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <You're> what? <laughs> Attitude. Okay. I don't know. That was a bad one. I liked it. Welcome to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. Ooh, one letter away from the classic singer. Daniel Johnston, a singer yes. songwriter. Yes. Speedy motorcycle. Speedy motorcycle. Welcome in, sir. Thanks for coming, Daniel. Welcome to Jamie Ottinger. All right. Ooh, a hard one to rhyme. Ottinger. Yes, yes. That is. Awesome. Jamie. Excellent. Welcome to Jamie. Welcome to be here. Welcome to Jamie. Play your gameies with Jamie. <laughs> Jamie. Yes. Play your gameies. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Jamie. Welcome to Anne Blundell. Thank you for supporting the show. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Anne Blundell. Yes. It's a great name. You are swell, Anne Blundell. Yes. Welcome to Josh B. Josh B. Welcome to be here. Just be yourself. Yeah. I feel like that's what he's saying to us. You know, it's encouragement. Josh B. Leafholt. All right, get out your hoes and steaks. It's Tracy Gardner. All right. And she's planting some veggies for yeah, us. Pull out those weeds. Plant some seeds. Plant some seeds for the hole. We're really good at this today. <laughs> and finally, our final welcome for this day, this Beliefful episode, is Katie Tedder. Yes. All right. What a cool yeah. name. Nothing better than Katie Tedder. Nothing it's a name. better than Tedder. Absolutely not. Give a big teddy bear welcome yes. to Katie Tedder. Oh, thank you guys so much for supporting the show. If you haven't heard your name yet, stick in there. Stick in there. Is that what you say? Sure. Stick around, hang in there, because we are getting through these names. And if you want to hear your name before we move this tier up, sign up soon. We know we've said that before, but we are going to be moving this to a higher tier just to slow it down because these can go on forever. And make sure to come on over, sign up for the expansion and join us as we delve into the spooky stories and strange goings-ons on the train tracks. This yes. is going to be a great year for us. We're going to continue to make improvements to the show and right. keep putting out awesome shows for you guys. So and a great year for you guys because you can be here with us and yes. we can enjoy your company. If you don't have friends or you're bored, <laughs> come join us in the hole and keep right, the we show no longer moving have friends. along. We no longer have friends because we spend all our time here. That's true. With you. Yes, pretty much. So thank you for being here. Don't leave us. Because <laughs> we need you. And hey, by the way, feel free to like, share, and review the show on any platform you choose. Spotify recently opened that up. So if you're listening there now, click on uh, the option to rate the show. And why not do five stars? You know? Also, why not? iTunes reviews are great. iTunes reviews are awesome. Facebook you recommendations. You want to head over to YouTube and hit subscribe and like the like the shows on there too. That's awesome as and well. And we see those. So thank you for all of you who have done those because we do see those come in. And we really, really... Appreciate it. If you can't, you know, sign up for the show, no worries. But if you like the show and you appreciate what we do, then those little things help a lot too. Yeah. And if you lend someone your car, leave it playing in on the radio. When yeah. They if you get own in. a billboard in a high traffic area of a downtown metropolitan area, Feel free. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Let us know. Please we'll, do that. We'll give you a large JPEG file. We'll give you an NFT. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Someday. Someday. Thank you for being here. Yes. And we will see you next time on Belief Hole. <laughs>